Okay, welcome back to World Crisis Media. The danger, therefore, is that the cliché stress tests will lead to very bad results. Citibank, Deutschebank at Commerzbank, Dexia of France, and National Bank of Greece. Credit Suisse, in a leaked document, points to Postbank of Germany, ATE Bank of Greece, National Bank of Greece, Hellenic Post Bank of Greece, Piraeus Bank of Greece, and Monte de Paschi, the Siena, all allegedly uh, in really bad shape. So what you can expect now is uh, the summer silly season will be filled with mutual accusations. You're bankrupt. You're bankrupt. I'm rubber and you're glue. You're really bankrupt, on and on and on. And, of course, this can resonate in a time when the actual real news in Europe in particular, because uh, you have the beginning of the summer shutdown in places like Italy, France, Bavaria, uh, this can work. Uh, it's also a time of relatively low trading volumes, as we, have, uh, as we have pointed out. There are also the questions, what are the criteria? First of all, who's being stress tested? We don't really know. 14 German banks, maybe 90 banks, 105 banks. What are the criteria? Who are the banks getting tested? And above all, do the criteria include national bankruptcy? In other words, what happens if you have a large sovereign debt default? According to the credit default swaps, Greece has a 40% chance of going bankrupt, so two in five. Spain has a 25% chance of going bankrupt, one in four, according to these credit default swaps. Naturally, the institutions putting out these figures are already, in most cases, 99% bankrupt. So uh, th these countries are actually much better off than the banks that are attacking them. But in order to make that visible to the world, they've got to take vigorous anti-speculative New Deal uh, measures. At any rate, uh, two weeks from, well, two weeks from today, right? It's the 9th of July as we record the broadcast. So we're headed towards the 23rd of July, and that's when Merkel says this is going to be brought out. Uh, much trouble in the meantime. Now, the, the European uh, Parliament has voted to limit the immediate cash uh, bonuses for uh, bankers. They say you can only get 30% of your bonus the first year. You've got to wait three years to get the, uh, the other 70%. The idea being, of course, is that they want to discourage some financial hotshot from concocting the world's most uh, toxic, kited mass of derivatives in the form of a synthetic CDO, a synthetic collateralized debt obligation, load that into a structured investment vehicle, plaster it around the outside with some credit default swaps, uh, and that makes money for a year, maybe. Uh, so he gets his big bonus, because that's how the bonus is calculated. But then, of course, in the out years, so to speak, it blows up. So they're trying to say you can't do that. It's all fine. It's just too late, because right? this has already happened. One half quadrillion, as an estimate, for Europe has already bankrupted 31 trillion of, uh, of banks. So it's 500 trillion of toxic derivatives loaded onto a banking system of 31 trillion can't work. Barroso, let's look at him, the uh, Portuguese head of the European Commission. He's supposed to carry these things out. Actually, in terms of the bonus limitations, it's the European finance ministers this coming week, the second week in July, so to speak. But uh, the European Parliament has a very bad track record of getting their stuff through. Case in point. Uh, the European Parliament voted in March that the Commission, European Commission, Barroso, was instructed to fight hard for the Tobin tax, the financial transfer tax, the Wall Street sales tax, the Robin Hood, sales, uh, Robin Hood tax, as the British call it, at the G20 in Toronto. Did he do it? No, he did not do it. I looked in the communique of the G20. There's nothing about financial transfer tax, Tobin tax or anything like that. If you find it, uh, I'd be happy to be corrected, but there's, there's nothing in there. So uh, that's uh, not a good track record. Rather, what Barroso does do, we had a delegation of the European trade unions under a guy called Monks go to see Barroso, and they're saying, here, we want financial reform, we want some limitations on the locust funds, the hedge funds. Uh, and Barroso said, you know, if you don't go along with my austerity plan, you're going to have a dictatorship. And he said, look, Spain, Portugal, and Greece 
If they don't do the austerity that I say, their democratic form of government will be out the window and they'll be under dictatorship. Naturally, Spain was under Franco until 1975, but amounted to a fascist dictatorship, although pretty fossilized by then. Salazar in Portugal had served even longer, served, had ruled until 1968, but the dictatorship there went on until the middle 70s. And Greece, of course, you had the junta of the colonels, Papadopoulos, which didn't get thrown out until the middle of the 17th, uh, until the middle of the 1970s. So uh, that's the, uh, the threat coming from Barroso. Take my austerity or you'll be under martial law. Now, here in the United States, Wall Street Journal, a week ago, Saturday, March 3rd, U.S. jobs picture darkens, payrolls are shrinking. Washington Post, dearth of new jobs threatens recovery. Yeah, well, uh, not a double dip. Nouriel Roubini, you are wrong. It is not a double dip. This is the second wave of a continuing world economic depression. And now in the middle of this, the people who have gone more than 52 weeks unemployed, uh, there is no fix for them. If you're unemployed between 25 to 52 weeks, there's nothing for you. If you're beyond 99, there was never anything even discussed. Now, the reactionaries, with the help of the various Tea Party fanatics, reactionary Republicans, Roosevelt haters, uh, irreducible, unreconstructed opponents of the New Deal, people who are really at war with the status quo, as we've seen it today, therefore not conservative, but reactionary. Let's take an example. Here we have the Wall Street Journal of uh, Thursday, July 8th. We have Art Laffer. Oh, Art Laffer. The Laffer Curve, supply-side economics, the voodoo economics, as Bush the Elder had it. And he was right. Voodoo economics that guided Reagan on his sure path to tripling the U.S. public debt, the entire U.S. public debt for 210 years or 15 years, whatever it was, until Reagan came in, he multiplied it by three, a 300 percent increase, the tripling of the public debt by Reagan, the great idol of the, uh, of the Tea Party set. So here's, here's our, our laugher. Unemployment benefits are not stimulus. They're, they're not stimulus. Well, from my point of view, they're not even supposed to be stimulus. They are a way to keep your pr- most precious resource, your mental capital, your human capital, your trained labor force, to keep that intact so that you can call on it for an economic recovery. And uh, that's what you're going to need. So it's not so much that this is going to stimulate, although in some minor sense it, it may, may well do that. It's mainly to maintain your labor power. But here's the interesting thing. The reactionary offensive against unemployment benefits argues that by offering people unemployment benefits, you encourage them to stay, stay unemployed because it's more attractive to stay unemployed. Now, the idea, of course, is what these reactionaries want is they want to drive down wages. They want you to have to take jobs at the minimum wage, that you go from $35 an hour to $7.50 or $7.25 as a minimum wage job. So these are reactionaries. They they want to increase the exploitation of labor, because nobody but nobody can live on on a minimum wage job. And you you can't even afford transportation. You can't even afford toothpaste in the morning at wages like that. But nevertheless, that's what these reactionaries want. Notice, they're not conservative. The American tradition is a high-wage economy, high-wage, high-value-added, high-intensity of capital, high-energy density. That's the U.S. success story. And they say, no, we want, want low-wage economy. We want sweatshops. We want people basically reduced to the level of ELOT. And that's Laffer. We'll get back to Laffer here in just a minute with his subjectivist uh, argument. 